oldest existing animated film in the world is British. It was made in 1899 by Arthur Melbourne Cooper to advertise Bryant and May matches and created a sensation when it was shown for the first time. It was astounding. The fact that he could actually manipulate these matchsticks, because they were matchsticks, and they were wired together with uh, light wire and animated frame by frame, so that these little characters ran about all over the place and even appeared to write the message on the wall. Matches and appeal. Ask patriots in the audience to donate one guinea to enable the Bryant and May Match Company to send a free box to every British soldier fighting in the Boer War. I don't think that Arthur Melbourne Cooper realised this, but when he started to make a film called Matches Appeal, he was putting together a film that was going to generate two of the most popular areas that have been taken up by animation. Propaganda and advertising. Murray Mitz, Murray Mitz, too good to hurry Mitz. For over a hundred years, propaganda and advertising have been the twin engines of the British animation industry. Because when it comes to selling, animation has proved it reaches parts other media cannot. It really dives deep into human imagination. It's a fantastic condensed form of communication. Have you tried delicious crunchy munchies? Try them! Animation does sell stuff, and it's memorable, and sometimes it's very funny. Brilliant! It was during the First World War that British animators became widely established as purveyors of propaganda. The style these early cartoonists used was based on an old music hall act called the Lightning Sketch in which a skilled artist would draw a picture in double-quick time. Animators took this one step further, jump-cutting the film to magically develop the picture before using animated paper cutouts to play out a satirical scene. They weren't aimed at kids, no, certainly not. Uh, they were made for an adult audience. And remember, this was during wartime, so they had to be amusing at the same time. You needed levity in a, in a state of tension. Cartoonists like Lancelot Speed would lampoon the German Kaiser, doubtless to the jeers and cheers of the audience. Self-evidently, when you're in a position of conflict with another country, what propaganda does is to try and isolate things that the public can understand clearly as things that can be ridiculed. These figures, though dangerous, though obviously part of the enemy, they are ultimately people that actually will not be victorious in a war. These jingoistic cartoons were shown in theatres and played an important role in keeping up morale. When war broke out again 20 years later, animation came into its own as a propaganda weapon. technique had become more sophisticated, but the message was the same. His patience is exhausted. What? Again? The point about animation is that it's a graphic medium, and that means that ideas are very quickly illustrated. So you can absolutely simplify a message down to a simple set of images, a, a very few words, a, a very minimal amount of movement, just to get a single message through. That's why it's good for propaganda, and that's why it's sometimes not very subtle. As war with Germany escalated, animators were only too pleased to ridicule Hitler and the Nazis as part of the war effort. Soon, animation would be used in a much more purposeful way by the Ministry of Information, but only after they tried and failed with other methods. By 1941, British cities were being blitzed, and there was a nationwide shortage of vital supplies like food and clothing and raw materials for weapons. Through cinemas, the government launched a huge propaganda campaign. 
What the government wanted to get across was the idea that this was a people's war. Now, lots of people can't participate, their farmers or their housewives and so on. So what they did with all those appeals to, you know, save rubbish, dig for victory and so on, what they were doing was trying to bring everybody into the idea that they were part of the war effort. <laughs> Under the leadership of an ex-advertising man named Jack Beddington, the Ministry of Information commissioned a series of films, of which this is a typical example. Its theme is the need to recycle scrap. Some people might very reasonably ask, what is the use of old bones? Now, just imagine a pile of them. An unattractive sight, and yet every scrap of bone is useful. And this is typical across a number of films, really, uh, from the 40s, is the idea that middle-classness, in a very British sort of way, is kind of educating us. And, uh, and those chaps who speak on those, on those films very much are telling us where the middle class wants us to be. And the working class, of course, who are depicting in, in, in these films are very much the people who have to learn. Well, sir, and ladies, I thank you. Salvage with a smile. That's me. The patronising tone of these live-action propaganda films did not have the desired effect on the public. Instead of listening to the government's message, the audience would often groan when the ministry logo came up and even ignore the film completely. Even the cinemas had contempt for it. They sometimes actually pulled the curtains when the, when the films were on and effectively they knew that the public were waiting for the features. So they had to do something. And Jack Beddington, who you know, was a very important figure really, recognised that animation could be the real point of access there. Beddington approached a recently established animation studio called Hallis and Bachelor to make a film on the same subject, donating scrap for the war. And they responded with the cheerful patriotism of the dustbin parade. Why don't you all join up? Join up? Where? Right over there, at the recruiting center. Go on, they're looking for fellows like you. Thanks, mister. The film showed exactly where and how the civilian contribution could help, but in a way that was now witty and engaging. Suddenly, tin cans take on a personality. The rubbish is literally processed into the needs of the war. Army uniforms, shells, and it's so much more successful than the live-action version. This was a new style of animation for British audiences, one that tipped its hat to the popularity of American Disney films, but whose message and tone were very British. You see the rubbish diving into molten vats, dying for the cause, literally. And, you'd, and you would never see that in, in, in American cartoons. You'd never see that in Disney cartoons. And this sense of sacrifice is crucial in those animations. Here we go, boys! Yippee! The combination of design style and political commitment that became Hallis and Bachelor's hallmark had its roots in the young studio's origins. A graphic artist who'd spent time at the famous German Bauhaus School of Modern Design, John Hallis was a Hungarian Jew who entered Britain in 1938 along with thousands of other refugees fleeing the Nazi concentration camps. Here, he met and married a talented English illustrator called Joy Batchelor. I think what they both had in common was ambition, and they both believed passionately in animation. They thought it was a new art form, or maybe not new, but they believed that it, it was an art form like any other and they wanted to make a difference. Good afternoon. We all expect vegetables to feed us, but we've got to see that we feed them properly first. Suppose we get down to the root of the matter. This is where humus comes in. Among the first staff to work at the Hallis and Bachelor studio was Vera Lineker. The whole point about animation is I think you can tell a story in 15 seconds that in live action would take half an hour or 20 minutes. There's nothing like drawing for getting it across 
it, it's quite an extraordinary medium, really. And you can also put pack information very much more clearly. This is why I think they used it. And a strong underground movement pressed the attack. In 1943, the studio was given an unusual commission, a series of cartoons to take the propaganda war to the Middle East. These films show the trials of Abu, a young Arab boy at the hands of a Nazi snake and his helper, the Italian bullfrog. Obviously the Middle East was crucial because the Middle East was where the oil came from and it was a place where there were either neutral countries or countries which were formerly colonial countries. Consequently, it was terribly important to win, to use a later phrase, the hearts and minds of people. And the way you did it, of course, was by entertaining them, by amusing them. Alison Batchelor made four films in this series, which were translated into Arabic and Persian and widely screened in the Middle East. They were anti-fascist films, and I don't think that they were exactly told what to do. They, they were given a brief, then they went away and developed it. And also, these films were made very quickly. If you think that um, during the war years, they made over 70 films. So I don't think they had much time to think. They got on and they did it. And sometimes one's best work is done under pressure like that. Alison Batchelor drew on Arabian folk imagery and myth to present the Nazi threat as a venomous reptile which peasant peoples would naturally fear. The Abu films were unashamedly anti-Nazi and pro-British. The British, of course, are presented, in, interestingly enough, as a military force, but as a sort of jokey military force, so that on the one hand they represent a kind of authority, but they also represent a source of help. For the duration of the war, such cartoons proved their worth as the sugared pill of propaganda. And although other animation studios were also producing information films, it was Hallis and Batchelor who emerged after the war as the most influential. We're interrupting the program to give you a fuel flash. When you're making up the fire, be sparing with the coal. And because animation was so good at selling the government's message in wartime, it would have a role to play in moulding the shape of Britain in peacetime. The end of the war in 1945 was a catalyst for change. A Labour government was elected, set on creating a new kind of society. When the Labour government came in in 1945 with a massive majority, it was committed to social change, social reform. The Labour Party's great victory shows that the country is ready for a new policy to face new world conditions. Nonetheless, you had to sell the idea, not just to the people who'd actually voted for the New Jerusalem, but you also had to persuade the sceptical that what was on offer was something of, of real change. So the Central Office of Information launched a nationwide cinema campaign using Hallis and Batchelor's expertise to sell its reforming message to the British public. By the time I moved in there, as well as the black and white stuff for the Central Office of Information. Um, the Labour government uh, wanted a series of films to put over their programme of uh, social reforms. So they came up with this idea of the, a character called Charlie, who represented the average man. 
actually he resembled my grandfather quite a lot and uh, he cycles around being rather obtuse and, and not wanting to um, have social security or be covered because he doesn't understand that it's to his advantage. Morning, George. Morning, Charles. Morning. Robinson Charlie starred in six short films and could never quite see the point of free trade, the new education policy or the new national insurance, but was gradually persuaded by the argument of the film. This new health service will be organised on a national scale as a public responsibility. And so everyone will pay for it. Hmm, thought there was a catch in it. And everyone will benefit from it. When Charlie was meant to be the classless everyman, appealing to both blue and white collar workers. But some found the character unattractive. Suppose your wife falls ill suddenly. Well, I didn't find it very appealing. I thought he was a bit of pompous, really. He was right. But my woman never is ill. Strong as a blooming horse she is. He had this enormous head, little tiny body, from what I remember. I didn't even like drawing him. He was horrible to draw. Phew. Glad that's over. I think the fault was largely in the design of the character. It looks to me rather like a, a puppet that has been drawn as a an animated cartoon. He wasn't flexible enough to show real feeling. What? You mean I've got to pay all that every week? And the product Charlie was selling, and the way he was selling it, were inflexible too. You can keep it. I'd rather go back to the days before we had any of your wonderful insurance. Getting across the ideas about the welfare state does seem in some ways forced. Propaganda, you know, we understand during the war, wants to impose its messages, wants to get the public on side. But getting across political and ideological ideas that are not geared towards an enemy is a completely different notion. You, am I glad to be back. The things I've been through. Alison Batchelor wasn't the only animation house making cartoons for a new Britain. The Larkin Studio was producing short films to the same brief, but with a very different style. And it was Larkin's that was now to play a key role in the development of British animation through the work of its charismatic principal director, Peter Sachs. Sachs made this film for the Tea Bureau about the need to make the most of the little tea that was available through rationing. When life is doleful drudgery, dark, down, drear. A cup of tea may bring good cheer. A cup of tea, did someone say? Okay, okay. It was Peter Sachs's design sensibility that was very important. His graphic design uh, training was effectively startling on the screen, uh, in the kind of almost the sort of the jagged modernist lines that he used. Crumbs, here it comes. It's a very sweet and engaging film, but it's important, I think, because there's a recognition that at the heart of tea drinking and the qualities of tea is also about the quality of human life. Is there a doctor in the shop? No. Stop. A doctor can't help the poor creature. What we need is a teacher. Sachs's philosophy on life and art were coloured by his background. Like John Hallis, Sachs worked as an animator in Europe before coming to Britain. Well, his background was Central Europe. He was German. Uh, he was uh, Jewish. Um, therefore, he had to get out of Germany, uh, otherwise he'd been thrown in a concentration camp. On arrival in London, they have a meal. And he got into Britain. And then, of course, they rounded up the, the Jewish refugees and put them on the Isle of Man. From all over the country. But then somebody found out that he had worked in the animation business and he wanted animation films at that time desperately to make films for the war effort. Sachs had spent the war at Larkin's studio, making secret films for the British military, using the clear lines of animation to help gunners tell the difference between enemy and friendly aircraft. Now he began employing his talents on information films for a variety of clients, experimenting with different styles of animation and technique. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most popular lectures I give, the Spit.
Before we condemn him for his roguery and twistery, let us examine his history. Peter's style was the design came first and the, animated, the animation supported the design. If it was limited animation, he didn't worry. He was much more concerned about the overall look. Pushing a barrow is no joke. Aha! Why not yoke the ox? And then one merely walks. Huh? He made you feel that what you were doing was important and good. The emphasis on quality was such that you couldn't get away with sloppy work with him. Now, my friends, let's keep off the peak. Let's switch off some of the electric fires and... Ah, Felicity, where were we now? The benefits of electricity. Sachs's reputation attracted some of the most gifted young British animators to work with him. Well, he was almost the animation version of um, the Continental Film Director. This will happen, he used to say. Incidentally, if you should perhaps uh, meet one of I think his ideas were very forward-looking and he had a very precise mind. He could analyse a subject very rapidly and try to think of a new way, like he'd come in and say, this morning we'll try Picasso, <laughs> you know, I mean, that sort of thing. While we wait, uh, let me expatiate. He was like Mr. Toad. He was always having these terrific enthusiasms. You know, I'd say, this week we're all going to work like Steinberg or something. I'd say, oh, yeah, Steinberg. Then, then he'd come and say, oh, forget that. We're all going to work like somebody else, you know. So we all were sort of uh, following his enthusiasm. This film for the British Iron and Steel Federation shows Sachs's love of German expressionism and his clever use of limited animation to maximum effect. The backgrounds were painted by a young trainee called Bob Godfrey, later to find fame as one of Britain's most successful animators and who was given his first job by Peter Sachs. He didn't teach me anything, really. I mean, I learnt by listening to him, saying that what really works in animation is big, generous movements or little fiddly movements, you know, because your eye goes towards that, that movement. It was all saying kind of things like that, and if you can animate a horse, you can animate anything, <laughs> which is more or less true. In keeping with his passion for experimenting with art house styles, for this corporate film, Sachs drew on the work of Bauhaus artist Paul Clay for inspiration. Friends, to make ends meet squarely in the middle, without any fiddle, some man replete with talents invented the balance. Literally, really, Sachs took the Paul Clay issue of taking a line for a walk. And effectively, these animated films often do that. They literally take a line, often as an abstract form in the first instance, but then form them into shapes and uh, obviously objects and uh, artifacts from the real world that the public associate with. But the tension between abstraction and sort of narrative and figurative imagery is very powerful in these films. 135 million quid we spent on that. There's lovely ideas in it too. For example, the noughts in, in big million figures are singing voices. Too bad. It was no accident that Peter Sachs and John Hallis were both emigres who'd arrived in Britain needing to make their way. Their combined energies had established the bedrock of an entire industry. Because they've been used to running things in their own countries, they actually brought a kind of entrepreneurialism, which meant that suddenly the, the, the British animation industry was, was forced to get its act together, because here were people who weren't just good animators, they were also good businessmen. Animation's next big sell was of international importance, and it took it further onto the political payroll. The war had left many European countries and their economies in ruins. So the American government came up with a financial aid package known as the Marshall Plan to restart trade and industry. 
General Marshall, who became Secretary of State in the United States government in 1947, that's the equivalent of Colin Powell, uh, proposed that huge amounts of American dollars were poured into Europe to rebuild the European economies. To me, the impressive fact is that these people of the United States made an overwhelming and unhesitating decision to do their best to bring Western Europe back to peace and prosperity. But of course, there's a price to pay. And that is the condition for getting these vast sums of dollars from the Americans was that Western Europe should lower its tariff barriers, should in effect become what it did become, which was the common market. The common market was something the Americans wanted to see happen. And that's why they were prepared to fund pretty folktale films promoting the idea of economic union. Alice and Batchelor were commissioned to make this film, the tale of a poor shoemaker and an elitist hatter, as an allegory about the potential benefits of free trade and the inevitable folly of protectionism. In a certain street, two traders live side by side. A shoemaker and a hatter. The plot is basically the shoemaker who is poor with a big family and the shop next door which is very exclusive, a hatter who only makes the best hats for the best people. And the shoemaker has this idea that you should make lots of shoes cheaply for everyone. But when shoes are needed so badly, surely he should make more, not less. Why not make more shoes with less effort by using more machines? And he realizes that if he goes to another country, he can trade shoes for something that he needs. Somebody somewhere must need shoes and be able to pay for them. And the shoemaker intended to find that somebody. First, he had to explain about the machinery. Unless he could sell his shoes, he must send back the machines. But this meant ruin for the machine maker, for he too must export. Too many restrictions were ruining trade between them. By the end of the film, the shoemaker succeeds in helping to overcome trade barriers between countries, and business thrives in a European common market. And efficient producers everywhere enlarged and increased production, which meant more work and more goods all round. They were also able to compete successfully for much needed world trade. The Americans had also commissioned the other principal British studio, Larkins, to make a film promoting the Marshall Plan. And Peter Sachs responded, not with a European folktale, but a more personal address to the people and the continent he'd left behind. Europe. Europe today. In every country, we face an unknown future. We hope for peace, for a life worth living. And yet, in Europe, we still have barriers. True to the aims of Marshall Plan propaganda, the film graphically illustrates the issue of European trade restrictions. They make it hard to trade the goods we have for the goods we need. And we all need things we haven't got. But Sykes' film was also a political call to arms for Europeans to turn their backs on the growing threat of communism. Marshall Plan money not only made these films, but also paid for them to be translated into the major European languages, including Russian, and shown all over the continent. The state decrees our place in the scheme of things and keeps us in it. What becomes much clearer now is the fact that the American government 
movement and the whole kind of American ideological agenda starts to impact very much on the process and on the making of these animated films. As the Cold War between America and Russia intensified, British animation became a weapon in the battle for hearts and minds. And the battle is fought by other means. And essentially, it's fought by ideas. My ideas are better than yours. My values are better than yours. Hallison Batchelor's high-profile handling of animations with political content brought them to the attention of an American producer called Louis de Rochemont. In 1952, he hired them to make Britain's first animated feature film, an adaptation of George Orwell's Animal Farm. The commissioning and making of this film was a great coup, and Hallis and Batchelor were touted in newsreels as the British Disney. After the plot has been outlined on the storyboard, producer John Hallis creates his characters. Visits to a farmyard have assisted him in his study of animal behavior, but not until he has the feel of the plot does he begin to draw. Then, of course, he doesn't need a model. They went from being a small film studio with a good reputation to being the largest studio, certainly in Britain, if not in Europe. Orwell's story takes place on a farm where the animals are beaten and starved by a brutal farmer. The animals rise up and rebel, driving the farmer out, and a new leader appears, a pig called Napoleon. From now on, I'll protect your interests, and I'll make your decisions. But the animals soon realize they've swapped one cruel dictator for another. First published in 1945, Animal Farm is an allegory of the Russian Revolution and the rise of Joseph Stalin. Who else is guilty? Stand up and confess! Animal Farm was being made as a serious piece of work. You know, it was trying to align itself with the feature-length live-action films, transcending animation as, as a kind of popular novelty entertainment and using the language of animation for serious purpose. Years passed. The seasons came and went. The short animal lives fled by. The film remains largely faithful to the book, but where Orwell left the animals under the terrible control of their new leaders, Alison Batchelor changed the ending so that the animals overthrew the Stalin character for a better, if undetermined, future. My father said, well, we had to change the end. I mean, you cannot send hundreds of audiences home disappointed. It would be too depressing. So uh, I think he took um, a more commercial view. To the animals, it now seemed that their world, which may or may not someday become a happy place to live in, was worse than ever for ordinary creatures. And another moment had come when they must do something about it. But this ending also fitted in with the ideology of the American backers. For we now know that the producer, Louis de Rochemont, was a frontman for the American CIA. And it was they who were funding this political warning of the perils of communism. In alighting upon Animal Farm as the perfect Cold War story, and getting that made by a British studio, what they could do, of course, was reinforce their ideas about the conduct of the Cold War and the ways in which uh, particular messages were made available to a general public. Did they know that Animal Farm was really Cold War propaganda? Well, I don't think that they did. They'd been looking for a project that they felt was meaningful. 
because they'd spent the war doing things that they felt was meaningful, and therefore they didn't want to do something that was lightweight. And whether the CIA was behind it or not is really irrelevant, because the film is what it is. The film premiered in New York in 1954, where its combination of animals, animation and politics was not an easy sell. Although the British press were more supportive on its UK release, Animal Farm was not the hit the makers had hoped for. It remains, however, a milestone in British animation history. I think it made people like the advertising agencies aware that there was a British animation industry so that when uh, commercials came in only a year later obviously they, they, their, their thoughts turned to using animation. Shivers, meat and fish paste, squeak, much fun on the In 1955 ITV was launched introducing American inspired advertising breaks Suddenly, animation was in demand, not from government, but from hundreds of clients keen to promote their brands to a potentially massive new audience. I really think without ITV, we wouldn't have had British animation as it is now because it was the complete underpinning of the money side. It was the bread and butter. What this brought to bear was the fact that Advertising requires distinctiveness in the ways it, it, it got across and sold its products, and animation was the perfect vehicle for that. And this is a very different kind of agenda, because you're selling brands that you want the public to consume. You don't want them to just take away propagandistic ideas and ideology and didactic uh, views. You want them to actually say, oh, that's entertaining, that's engaging, I'll go out and buy that toothpaste. Animation's classlessness was one of its main attractions for advertisers and viewers. In the early years, perhaps a third of all TV commercials were animated. Unlike the previous information films that had five or ten minutes to sell an idea, on television, animators had just 30 seconds. It was like stagecoaches going to locomotives. They give us a jingle. And all we had to do was dance to it, basically. The early commercials were like sound radio. Television was available in two colours, black and white, and early adverts were quite primitive. With the sudden growth in the industry, many of the more ambitious young animators left the big studios to join smaller companies or set up their own. Suddenly, everybody had work. <laughs> that was the most exciting thing. And then the studios springing up in all directions, you know, even from one man and a dog to, to the big studios. Arthur McDougall. More women choosing. Arthur More women using. It was the very beginning of ITV, you see and you didn't really need any capital as long as you could get hold of a camera and a few people knew how to draw, you could set up. A pint of oil, please. A pint of XL, please. Suddenly 40 little animation studios sprung up all like mushrooms. A pint of Castrol XL, what I want. Hire equipment, get an Aeroflex, get a Mitchell. For the day, you know, so you, you could start a production company in a telephone box. <laughs> you know, you could suddenly, suddenly you had the equipment, you know, you could do it. So he did. Bob set up Biographic with editor Keith Lerner, and they were later joined by Nancy Hanna and Vera Lineker. Biographic had a fresh approach that worked well for the new faster style ads. <laughs> One of the kind of interesting things about Biographic, particularly in the shape of Bob Godfrey, is Bob Godfrey's resistance to the whole idea that animation has to be from the Disney style or from a modern art style. Glenric Pilchards, they are great. Penny for penny, they contain three times the protein in the most expensive beefsteak. He wants it, as it were, to be much more simple, direct, straightforward, and actually not be full animation, you know. Uh, the, the figures can jump about a lot, they actually don't have to do fluid lyrical movements, they can just 
jump from one thing to another. Hit the deep time rack, the deep time roll, bring the pie and the milk, don't forget sugar bowl. Then to add a delicious taste, cook another part of Shippum's face. So insist on Shippum's, that's the paste you want to tea. You see, when commercial television came, we couldn't do traditional animation because it was too expensive and it took too long. So we would find quick cutout ways of doing things. It's Freddy Freddy! We were very forward looking, avant garde. <laughs> I think people were trying to experiment, you know, trying to make different ways of expressing things instead of, you know, following the usual type of drawn animation. I think with advertising you can be as creative as, as you're allowed to be. Our commercial work has been hugely appreciated worldwide. It's been recognised for its technical skill, for its aesthetic skills and for its sheer invention. Animation's broad appeal made it the perfect international sales vehicle and overseas clients began to use British animators to promote their products abroad. Barclays Bank, before na use. Mekuna put na money for there. This advert was made for release in West African cinemas and animated at the Larkin Studio, now part of the Film Producers Guild. The Film Producers Guild were approached by Barclays Bank for a film to encourage rural people in West Africa to put their money in the savings bank rather than putting it in the thatch or burying it in the ground. This story we tell, it concerns three farmers. We take them good to sell for the market. Then and it seemed to me that if we were going to work on something which had to appeal directly to people in West Africa, it'd be nice to have some of the same kind of music. Dick Taylor and his team found a young music student called Sam Akaparbot, who came up with a West African street band style soundtrack and told the story in a local dialect. One of them farmers, he get a plenty sense. He go for Barclays Bank and they keep him money well. It went down very well once the bank had gathered the courage to show it because they were persuaded that something that showed caricatures of Africans would in fact infuriate the Africans. But in the end they showed it and the film was extremely successful and ran for years and years and years and people used to go along to the cinema especially to see it. Not all animated portrayals of Africans were as sympathetic as this Coco ad demonstrates. What is it suits the savage best? What is it pleases host and guest? What's nicer and better than all the rest? Rouchies, 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 rouchies! Coco! By the mid-60s, TV adverts had become part of Britain's popular culture, and one of the most memorable campaigns was about a group of city gents working in a flower factory. The Home Pride Flower Men were one of the first successful examples of character branding. They were animated by Ron Wyatt and Tony Catanio, although the idea for the little English flower graders had actually come from two Americans. When I came in with a matchstick man, and because they're Americans, um, they thought all Englishmen wore bowler hats. And they said, we've got this wonderful idea. These blokes with bowler hats all go in this bag of flour. Tonight, our outside broadcast cameras are here to give you the inside story on the Home Pride flour graders. And they throw out all the lumps, and they come out, and they wipe this bag, because you don't know what it is yet. It wipes it, and underneath, because it's all covered in flour, it's the packet. Are you finished? And well, because they've been in there, they, got, they haven't got black bowler hats in, well, they've got white bowler hats. How about that? <laughs> what a great idea. <laughs> I told you. And anyway, and they said, and then grady grains make finer flour. And I said, no, that won't work. The flour that grades every grain, because grady grains make finer flour. So that's here. But graded grains and bowler hats caught the British imagination. And within four months, Home Pride was a brand leader. <laughs> 
Wyatt and Catania went on to animate a host of other commercially lucrative characters. Oh, we are the lads from Country Life. I'm the noodle doodle. I found that if you got a character or a personality, you had a good bit of merchandising property there. You could, you had a product identity. I think every company wants its own property that it can use uh, uh, for a long time. Everyone's looking for that. Baby, I will be your ever-loving fan. Creating a successful animated character is as hard as finding the next Elvis. It's the holy grail of commercial animation. It's like, you know, what makes a star and what makes just a normal actor. You, you know when you're in the presence of a star. Well, a drawing is no different. An animator is no different. Cresta Bear had star quality. He appeared in a series of ads in the 70s and was the brainchild of animator Dick Williams and advertising executive John Webster. We created this uh, bear who had a kind of a spasm, which was pinched from um, Jack Nicholson in Easy Rider. When he takes a drink of whiskey, he goes into this kind of nick, nick, nick. First of the day, he says. And this became a feature in all the ads. He did, did this spasm. And uh, it got picked up by the children, and they all copied it and did it in the playgrounds, and uh, it became quite well known. Cresta Bear sold lemonade to thousands of children who'd never seen Easy Rider, but who loved the crazy bear and his catchy slogan. It's Friday, man. I think animals work particularly well in animation because I think we as human beings have a tendency to, to sort of anthropomorphize our animals anyway. We give them human personalities, characteristics, even with our pets. And somehow in animation, you can actually make that happen. You can actually give them a personality. Aura. That's too orangey for crows. It's just for me and my dog. I'll be your dog. Anthropomorphic ads like these literally brought brands to life. And it was an animated animal that the central office of information turned to in the 70s to get across a message about child safety. Charlie says that if ever you see a box of matches lying around, tell mummy because they can hurt you. I was using cutout animation and the same literally bits of cutout paper could be transferred from one film to the next. So it was, it was in a very economic job from that point of view. The very basic animation was carried by the voice track with the bizarre yowls of Charlie the Cat interpreted by his young master. Charlie was voiced by the DJ and comedian Kenny Everett. He volunteered to do the entire soundtrack, in fact. Music effects everything. The only thing was that the voice he provided for the boy was terribly transatlantic and not at all nice. And so I used all the work he'd done except the voices, the boy's voice, and I recorded when he was a child to do it. But just then, Charlie tried to do an extra big jump and he went over the edge and into the water. Kenny Everett and the neighbor's child spoke directly to their audience proving that in animation, the voice is crucial. It was very lucky for him, he caught on the line. In the 1980s, the idea of using ordinary people's voices to sell something was taken a step further. Oh, good heavens, what's that you've got there? That's my new electric ceramic hog hooker. Oh. The heat electric ads combined the unscripted musings of members of the public with witty animation and gave Ardman Animation their first break into advertising. The great thing about the advertising business is it's hungry, very hungry for ideas. Brilliant. What they can do with technology today. The advertising world is full of people who are actually all looking outward, all around the world, and they're looking for something new. And we had something very, very new there. <laughs> Not like some of these other things, you know, that are just there to, you know, oh, this looks pretty in my kitchen. You know, it's there to do its job and it does it, does it, does it well. It was a clever approach, you know, this sort of documentary style, real people talking and let's put animals yeah. into those voices. Bob's your uncle is done. 
Now everybody's doing it. Hundreds of students are doing it every year in their graduate films and stuff. But then it was pretty novel, and it was done so brilliantly. I used to do the washing up before we had a dishwasher, and it took an hour and a half. It was hellish. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, these days we don't fight about it. We, we used to always argue about who was doing the dishes. No, I bet it was something completely new, understated, and yet wonderful humour. And if you had to pick one animation house that represents Britain, it would be our movie. It's like the last piece of the jigsaw. When musician Peter Gabriel was looking for someone to rejuvenate his record career in the mid-80s, he turned to animation and to Aardman. The resulting video used stop-frame animation in ways that hadn't been seen before, certainly by a record-buying public. This felt like a very... capturing the spirit of an age, really. It was very British. It was one of those points where you just thought, oh, this is something new, and it moved us up another rung, as it were. It just felt like it was kick-starting potentially a new era, which it did. The big appeal was that every frame of the finished film, that what you see, you would have seen if you'd looked through the camera at it. There was no post-production, there was no electronic tinkering. In the modern day, if you wanted um, Peter Gabriel's face to turn blue and clouds to cross it, that, you could do that so easily with um, electronic effects. But we did it whereby he sat in a chair like this and somebody painted his face blue and then somebody painted the cloud on and then we took a couple of frames on the camera and then they painted over the cloud and painted it on again a little bit further and so on and so on and so on. It's always been the case that animation has remained experimental even as it's entered the popular mainstream. And in the British tradition, this has been hugely consistent. Because of the video, Sledgehammer made number one, not only in Britain, but also America, where it was showcased on the new international music channel, MTV. Like ITV in the 1950s, MTV provided a new influx of commercial clients for British animators. I suppose what you could say about MTV is that finally the commercials take over. Because what, after all, is a pop promo but a commercial for a pop record? So what you actually finally end up, which I suppose is the glorification of commercial television in the end, is you have wall-to-wall -wall advertisements, only they're called pop videos. The music industry has become one of the biggest consumers of animation, where it can be used to enhance or repackage a band and create a world around them. And the introduction of computer-generated images, or CGI, has given the industry a whole new world to explore, the key word for advertisers being new. I think one of the most powerful things about commercial animation is it's constantly pushing for new things. The most common thing you hear is from an agency is we want something that looks different. And because that's the most common brief, it really forces people like ourselves and my competitors to look for new things. This award-winning video uses CGI, but in ways that software designers probably hadn't imagined. Drawing on old-fashioned animation techniques such as cutouts and model making, Tim Hope experiments by bringing a new depth to computer imaging. I never liked computer graphics. It always looked dead, and the characters were dead, and the, the worlds were um, ugly. So I always said, well, actually, you can just scan pictures in, stick it on a shape in 3D and move it. I've been in animation a long time and nearly always I can tell how things are done. 
But when I saw his work, it completely blew me away because I quite honestly didn't know how it was done. And I said, how does he do it? I mean, what's it done? Oh, he does it on a computer. <laughs> and, oh, on a computer, does he use a light box? No, he doesn't use a light box, no. He, he makes it up as it goes along, you know, and he just does this. And I was just amazed by it. A strong element of Tim Hope's work is carrying on what the best of British animation has done for a hundred years, which is to sell its customers a vision of Britain. When I look back over the years at the things that brought tears to my eyes. I think I'm, my stuff is very British. The architecture's all based around London, and it's Dixons and Curries and uh, housing estates and masses of satellite towns. The high street is so uniform now, I think that's a defining thing of modern Britain. Computer technology means that reality and fantasy can now coexist on screen. When this is done to promote a serious message, as in a recent charity public information film, the effect can be disconcerting and powerful. Now what the hell are you up to? Look at the state of this place! The NSPCC ad, I think that was a script that really needed animation because he was this ad of a very sort of dark, grungy, live action setting of a, of a real person beating up an albeit animated kid. And we're used to seeing, you know, if you think Tom and Jerry, we're used to seeing violence in, in animation where the characters do bounce back. I think it had to be animation. I don't think people could have tolerated it uh, as live action. It would have been too much. British animation's ability to create this kind of impact means that new clients are using its services and old clients keep coming back. Well, see, the European Parliament is wrong. Uh, 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 I don't do politics. Hmm. Surely they're not digging it up again. Uh, uh, you don't do politics. Remember. The government still uses animation to get a political message across, but today it's democracy rather than war which needs selling. Politics affects almost everything, so if you don't do politics, there's not much you do do. What, last orders? Is... <sighs> Propaganda and advertising have come a long way since Arthur Melbourne Cooper broke new ground promoting patriotism and matches. Today, British animation continues to be at the forefront of new ideas and techniques. It's all about strong graphics, strong colours, fast cutting, new looks, new techniques. And quite frankly, I think we're the world leaders uh, at that. I don't think there's anybody to beat us. And British animators continue to push the medium as an art form while still delivering the sponsor's message. Hate something, change something, hate something, change something, make something better. Oh, isn't it just bliss when a diesel goes like this? Next week, how animation's been used to satirise and subvert the status quo from yellow submarine to monkey dust. That's next Monday at 9. But stay with us now for Creature Comfort, some of those classic post-war ads and music videos without comment. Just enjoy. Next. Sing it like you hate it. Hate something. Change something. Hate something. Change something. Make something better.